Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, howdy. Good to see you guys this morning. My name is Timothy Atik. I'm the new director of Breakaway Ministries in College Station. Uh, just wanna just wanna say welcome real quick to everyone uh, at the Klein Campus, Center Court East, Center Court West, as well as the Woodlands Campus and online. I love just the opportunity to be here at Faithbridge. So thankful for this church and all that is going on here. Um, I'll start out this morning by simply saying, men, I don't know what you, can, you would consider to be the greatest kind of testosterone-filled man movie of all times, but for me, uh, Braveheart is pretty high on the list, and uh, one of the reasons that I love Braveheart is that it's just full of great quotes, and uh, just one of my favorite quotes in the movie and that has everything to do with what we we're talking about today is this very serious moment where William Wallace says, he declares, every man dies, not every man really lives. Okay, that was terrible, okay. (laughs) Okay, here we go. But listen to what he says, because I think that there's a lot of truth to it. He says, every man dies, not every man really lives. And I think that he's right. I mean, think about it. He says, every man dies. We get that, right? No one hears that and says, well, no one can know for sure, it's debatable. No, we get it, every man dies. But then he goes on and says, but not every man really lives. And if that's true, then what that means is that there's people all throughout this world and and even in this room who will go through life and never truly experience that fullness of life, fullness of joy, Peace, satisfaction, and adventure that we all long for. That is what we long for, right? See, it doesn't matter where you stand in regards to spirituality. The common denominator in the room this morning is that every single one of us is ambitious to experience the most life possible. That's what we are all after. You think about the scale of life, one being no life at all, ten being life to the full. Where do you hope to land on that? Like anyone here saying, eh, I'll settle for a four or a five because mediocrity is kind of my thing. No. We all want to land at an eight, nine, or ten. Every single one of us longs to go through life and experience fullness of joy, peace, satisfaction, purpose, and adventure. What I want to show you this morning is one of the reasons that many of us will stall out at a four, five, or a six. The reason that many of us will go through life and feel like that life that we truly want is just past our fingertips. The the reason is that something will be broken in our lives and we won't allow Jesus Christ to step in and heal that which is broken. See, if you were to spend time reading the Gospels, you would see that Jesus Christ is in the business of healing that which is broken. If you want to be one of those people who go th- goes through life and, and you, don't, you don't just die, but you go through life and truly live, I promise you, you will need to become personally acquainted with Jesus Christ as healer. And it all begins with you answering the question that Jesus asks in John chapter 5. So if you have a Bible, I want you to join me this morning. If you're one of those people who truly wants to live I want you to join me this morning in John chapter 5. John chapter 5, the the first three verses are going to kind of set the scene for us. It says this. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem Now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And so this this sets a scene for us. Jesus heads to Jerusalem, and while in Jerusalem, he goes to the pool known as 
Bethesda. And what the text tells us is that this pool is a gathering place for invalids. That term is a general term referring to those who are sick, weak, or feeling powerless. Okay? And the text gives us some examples of who's in attendance. It says that there are those who are blind, those who are lame, meaning crippled, and those who are paralyzed. Now, I want you to think about these people in a specific way. I want you to think of them as people who have something broken in their lives. So, for example, it says that there are those who are blind who are in, the, in attendance. If you're blind, then in a sense, your eyes are broken. They're not working as they should. It says that there were lame, crippled, or paralyzed people. Uh, these people's legs were, in a sense, broken. They, were, they weren't working as they as they should. There was something broken about them, okay? Now, take that truth and combine it with the truth that invalid refers to someone who feels powerless. Put those things together, and what do we find out? We find out that the pool of Bethesda is a gathering place for those who have something broken in their lives, and they feel powerless to do anything about it, okay? I want to make a clarifying statement real quick, and and I don't want you to miss this, okay? If you or someone you know has a physical disability, I need you to be clear that today I'm in no way implying that if you have a physical disability, you cannot experience fullness of joy or life like I'm talking about. In fact, I would say that often people who have a physical disability experience more life and more joy and more peace than those who have no disability. At least I've, I've seen that happen before. But what I do want to make clear is that I believe that the author here in John chapter 5 is trying to paint a picture of people who are missing out on life because something in their lives is broken. So on the scale of life, one being no life at all, ten being life to the full, these people would say that they are probably at a one or a two because something is broken and they feel powerless to do anything about it. Okay. Now this is where things get very important. As I was studying this text, the thought that I had was, what if this place, Faith Bridge Church, right here in Spring, Texas, July 2016, what if this room right here is a lot like the Pool of Bethesda? What if this room is actually a gathering place for people who have something broken in their lives and they feel helpless to do anything about it? Now, you might hear that and say, well, don't lump me in with that because nothing's broken in my life. But let me just ask some questions real quick. If the majority of decisions that you make each day are driven by the need for someone's um, approval, acceptance, uh, if, if your decisions are driven by this need for someone to validate you, can't we agree that there's something broken there? Because what that means is that your life is just one big audition. It's like, it's like real life American Idol, where every moment of every day, you are auditioning in front of a panel comprised of your family or your friends, your coworkers, your boss, and your need is for them to validate you, approve of you, and like you. Can't we agree there's something, there's something broken about that? If a lot of times you lie or tell half-truths or exaggerate about who you are, what you have, or what you've done in hopes of getting people to think more highly of you, can't we agree that something isn't working as it should? If you only see the negative in yourself, you look at the, what you see in a mirror and you hate it, you look at the number on a scale and despise it, you only see your flaws, You only see your insufficiencies, your inadequacies. Can't we agree that there's something broken there? Something's not working as it should. On the flip side, if you only see your positives, you don't think you struggle. Well, that's your struggle. Your struggle is that you don't struggle. Can't we agree that there is something not working right? If you're an angry person, Like you just wake up angry sometimes. You don't even know why you're angry. You just know that you are. And when you are angry, you can be explosive. You can be manipulative, extremely hurtful to the people around you. Can't we agree that there's something broken there, that something isn't working as it should? 
If you have this bitterness and resentment stored up in your heart towards someone who has wronged you to the point that you can't be in the same room as them or you just hear their name mentioned and it, it elicits this negative emotional response, can't we agree that there's something misfiring inside of you? Something's not working as it should. If you constantly run back to things that, that you don't want to do, whether it's escaping the fantasy worlds on the internet or uh, overeating or undereating, manipulating your diet in an unhealthy way or un- overspending, can't we agree that there's something broken there, that something isn't working as it should? And if something is broken in your life, can't we agree that you are missing out on life? Because if something is broken in your life, you are missing out on the life that you would be experiencing if that which was broken was actually working properly. So just think about that real quick. What in your life is broken? What is causing you to miss out on life? Now, look back at the text because uh, John is actually going to focus in now on one specific guy in the crowd. It says this, verse 5, One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And so we see this this zoom now on one particular person, and it tells us, it gives us an interesting detail. It says that this man has uh, been an invalid for 38 years. I just want to put it in the language that we've been using this morning. This guy has had something broken in his life for 38 years. You want to feel crazy for a second? Just take a moment and think, how long has a specific thing been broken in your life? Like, how long have you been angry? How long have you been needing someone else's approval? How long have you been looking at pornography? How long have you been drinking too much? How long, you, you know, just, just think about it. You might be able to, to kind of rewind and pinpoint where it started. And you just pause and think that you might realize, man, I have had something broken in my life for this long. I can look back on this time in my life where um, I had been working at this church and I left that church just feeling really hurt and wounded by these three men on staff. And uh, I just allowed this bitterness and resentment to well up inside of me. And uh, it consumed me to the point that if I drove past the church or if I heard these men's names mentioned, it would just elicit this really negative response in me. And uh, bitterness and resentment ate away my soul for four years until God miraculously brought reconciliation in those relationships. But I look back on those, that time, and I can just look back and say, I allowed myself to be robbed of life for four years. It makes me feel crazy a little bit to just say, man, I let that go on for four years straight. I allowed bitterness and resentment to just rot my soul, and I missed out on life. How long have you been missing out? When I was in sixth grade, my cousin took my brother and I to Dallas Love Field Airport, and it had been raining outside, and so my cousin had this umbrella that uh, didn't have a handle on it. It was just the metal end of the umbrella. And it was just a, it was a, such a freak accident. We were standing in the terminal, and my cousin asked me if I had something to write with, and so I was bent down looking in my backpack for something to write with, and as I was doing that, my cousin threw the umbrella on the ground, and it popped open, and the metal end shot straight up and hit me directly in my right eye. And I went into the bathroom, and I pulled down my eyelid, and there was this massive red abrasion on my eye. And it didn't help that I was sobbing like a little girl, or a little boy, if that offends you ladies. But anyway, uh, I mean, it, I, was in, I was in massive amounts of pain, and so I ended up having to go to the emergency room, and uh, the doctors made me start wearing an eye patch. And I will never forget this eye patch, um, because it was this blue fabric with some white fabric on top of the blue fabric, and there was a picture of a Dalmatian dog on it. (laughs) So just imagine being in sixth grade with your eye patch screaming, please give me a swirly in the toilet, okay? (laughs) So that's what was happening for me. But after I got rid of the eye patch, 
Um, the result of that situation was that I developed an eye floater, which means, I don't know if you know what an eye floater is, but it, it means that I, I see a black dot permanently right here in my right eye. And for the first year, I kid you not, like I just thought that there was a mosquito always around me. <laughs> like I would be like, you know, out in the lobby after the first hour, there was a legitimate fly and I went like this and these people were like, is that your eye floater? It's like, no, there was a real fly, I think. Okay, I'm not sure, but I think. And uh, now that one eye floater has gotten some friends and now there's, uh, I see multiple black dots permanently right here. But I've just gotten used to it. Like, I have just gotten used to bad sight in my right eye. The world that I know is a world that has black dots right here. That's the world that I know. And I've just learned to live with it. I've adjusted to that type of world. And the reason I tell you that is that I think a lot of times that's what happens with the brokenness in our lives. Something stays broken in our lives for a long enough period of time that we just get used to it. And the life that we know, the world that we know, is a world where this particular thing is broken in our lives. And so we begin to just tell ourselves, that's who I am. I'm just an angry person. I'm just an insecure person. That's what I, I need people's approval. That's just kind of who I am. And you begin to believe that life at a four or five with something broken is actually life at an eight, nine, or ten. That's why I've watched people um, cut people out of their lives and walk in anger and bitterness and resentment, yet still believe that they're experiencing deep amounts of intimacy with the Lord. That's not possible. That's why guys will be addicted to pornography and they'll tell themselves it's not that big of a deal and believe that they are still experiencing life at an eight, nine, or ten. Th those two, that doesn't equate and you've bought into a lie. How long have you been missing out on life? How long has something been broken? Now watch this. Jesus interrupts this man's life with a question. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? Can you imagine this this scene, here's a guy who's been paralyzed for 38 years and Jesus just walks up and matter-of-factly asks him, do you want to be healed? I wonder what the guy did. I wonder if he was like, I'm sorry, you're going to have to repeat your question because what I thought I heard you say was, do you want to be healed? And I know you didn't say that. Can you imagine? Jesus just walks up and in a moment in time after 38 years, he assumes that the impossible is possible. Just think, this guy... The lens through which he sees his life is through his paralysis. The lens through which people see him is through his paralysis. His paralysis, had it was his identity. In a moment in time, Jesus walks up and assumes that it can all change. Do you believe that in your own life? No matter how many failed attempts for change, do you believe that the impossible is possible in your life? If Jesus steps in and does something? The other thing, though, that I, I really want to point out is that Jesus gave him the option, right? Jesus didn't just walk up and be like, uh, be healed. He asks a question. Do you want to be healed? What's the guy going to say? No? Uh, no, thanks, but I bet that blind guy, he'd love to talk to you over there. I'm good. No, it seems like a ridiculous question. Of course he would want to be healed. But I think it's a really valid question for us today. Do you, do you even want to be healed? Because if you think about it, if, if Jesus brings healing in your life, then things are going to change. And sin is going to be uprooted from your life. And the reason that you keep running back to sin is that sin can be attractive and it can be very satisfying at least for a short period of time. So do you even want to be healed? Over the years, I've spent a lot of time counseling high school students and college students who are in dating relationships, and there's different times where I'll be sitting with a student telling me about their relationship, and it becomes very clear very quickly 
that they need to get out of the relationship, that it's an unhealthy relationship for them to be in. Do you want to know why they don't take my advice to get out of the relationship? Here's the, here's the exact words that they tell me. I just can't imagine my life without him in it. Do you hear what they're saying? What they're saying is, I realize that this relationship might be stealing some life from me, but at the same time, I'm also acknowledging that it's giving me some life. And so what I'm afraid to do is I'm afraid to let go of this relationship for fear of missing out on the life that it is giving me. Now, it might be stealing more than it's giving, but I'm scared to let go of what it is giving me. Now, I need you to know I'm not talking about I'm not making a point about dating relationships right now. I am making a point about the relationship that we often have with the brokenness in our life. Because if Jesus steps in and says, do you want to be healed? I wonder if some of us might answer and say, you know what, I, I, I don't know if I want to be healed, Jesus, because I don't know if I can imagine my life without this in it. Because, yeah, it might be stealing some life from me, but it's also giving me some life, and I fear missing out on the life it does give me. I don't know that I can imagine my life without pornography in it, because what if, you know, I'm a guy, and what if my needs aren't met? You know, I don't know if I can imagine my life without um, uh, seeking people's approval, because what if my parents never validate me? What if these friends or my boss or my coworkers never validate me? I don't know if I can be okay with that. If I let go of this bitterness and resentment towards that person who wronged me, if I forgive them, what I'm telling them is you won. I don't know if I can imagine my life without that in it. I don't know if I can let that go. Because maybe it's stealing some life, but it's also giving me some life, and I don't want to miss out on that. So it is a valid question to us this morning. I mean, do you even want to be healed today? Now look at his response. Verse 7. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm, a go while I'm going, another steps down before me. Now, I want to be clear. This guy's response is really good and really bad at the same time. It's an accurate response and an inaccurate response at the same time. The reason that his response to Jesus' question, do you want to be healed, is a good response is because he says, I don't have anyone to help me into the water. What he's saying is, I realize if I'm going to be healed, it's going to require the help of other people. And that is true. That's true. God rarely heals people in isolation. God uses his people to heal his people. That's why James says in James 5.16, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. God often uses his people to heal his people. So it brings up a very good question. Do you have a few men or a few women in your life with whom you can be fully known and fully loved? I'm not asking you if you have friends I'm asking you if you have people in your life who can celebrate your strengths, yet they've also seen behind the curtain and they're familiar with your, um, with your offensive tendencies, your sinful ways, and your insecurities. Do you have anyone like that in your life who's willing to kind of press in on you? And they love you too much to just tell you what you want to hear. They love you enough to tell you what you need to hear. And they're committed to fighting for you and pointing you to Jesus. Do you have anyone like that in your life? If not, that might be the right time for you to step into a small group setting with some men or some women here at the church. The reason that this guy's response is inaccurate or uninformed is because he believes that there's another source for healing besides Jesus. Do you see what he says? He says, I have no one to help me into the water, believing that the water is what will heal him. See, there was this superstition around the water that uh, every once in a while an angel would come and stir the waters, and the first person in the waters after it was stirred would be healed. What you need to realize is that the only true source for healing is Jesus. And let me tell you why. The reason why 
is at the root of any brokenness is sin. Sin is at the root of all brokenness. So when you look out into our world today, when you, when you watch the news and you have that, that just sinking feeling inside of you that says there is something messed up about this world. And I think we can all agree on that. That this world is a broken place. The reason that this world is broken is because of sin. Sin is at the root of all brokenness. Sin is at the root of your brokenness. And you need to know, in the history of humankind, Jesus Christ is the only one who has ever successfully dealt with sin. Jesus is the only one who has ever conquered sin. That's what he accomplished on the cross. When he died on the cross, what he did is he took the sins of the world upon himself and on the third day he rose from the dead, conquering sin and death. He did what no one else can do. He conquered sin. If you're going to experience healing in your life, it will have to have everything to do with Jesus. So you can go to the self-help book section at Barnes & Noble You can talk to a friend. And you know what? I encourage you to talk to a friend. If you need to go to a counselor, I encourage you to go see a counselor. But make no mistake, Jesus is the one who will accomplish the healing in your life. Now watch how things play out for this man. Verse 8, it says this. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once... The man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Will you just put yourself in this scene for a second? This guy has been paralyzed for 38 years. In a moment in time, his life collides with Jesus. And Jesus says these crazy words, get up. But in that moment, a tingling sensation starts in his toes. And that's very new for this guy. That's something he's never felt before. And then that tingling sensation spreads throughout the entirety of his foot. That's new as well. And it moves up through his calves and then into his thighs. And then he makes probably the, the most courageous move of his life and he attempts to stand up. I don't know what that scene looks like. I mean, I've seen a nine-month-old pull up on something for the first time and talk about just kind of the shock on their face of like, wow, this is a whole new perspective on life. This is extremely different. I don't know if it was kind of a wobbly start for this guy. I don't know if he just shot up. I don't know how it went for him, but I would imagine that that was a pretty powerful moment to see. And then came the first step. And can you imagine, after 38 years of paralysis, when he takes that first step, he shoots up the scale of life. With just one step, he goes from a one or a two to an eight, nine, or ten. Why? Because that's what Jesus is in the business of doing. He is in the business of moving people up the scale. This is what Jesus is in the business of doing as healer. He is in the business of moving people up the scale. I've experienced it and I've witnessed it. I've experienced Jesus moving me up the scale, healing me from an addiction to pornography when I was in college. I've watched Jesus move people up the scale, healing them from a need for other people's approval. I've watched Jesus move people up the scale, releasing them from the bitterness and resentment in their hearts. I've watched Jesus move people up the scale, healing them from an eating disorder or addiction to different substances. This is what Jesus does. What if Jesus wants to move you up the scale this morning? If you're at a three or a four, what if he wants to move you up to a four, five, or six? If you're at a five or a six, what if he wants to take you to a seven, eight, nine, or 10? What if he wants to move you up the scale this morning? It's going to start with you answering this question, do you want to be healed? Do you even want to be healed? Now, I would imagine that some people sit there and say, man, this sounds really good in theory. But when it comes to reality, I know I've already tried for years. 
I've tried to make progress and nothing has happened. And what if Jesus doesn't heal me? Well, let me just be clear. You know what? Um, sometimes Jesus heals as he healed in this story. Sometimes it is just an instant instant moment of healing and you hear those stories where someone says, you know what, this happened in my life and I never went back. You know what, sometimes it's a process and it can even be a lifelong process that begins now and Jesus slowly but surely begins accomplishing healing in your life. You know what, sometimes Jesus overnight takes you from a one or a two to a nine or a 10. But even if he doesn't do that, can't we all agree that a four is better than a three? Isn't a five and a half better than a five? What if Jesus wants to begin moving you up the scale, but it requires you to take a step and answer this question, do you want to be healed? If you're here this morning and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, what I need you to understand, if you're sitting there this morning realizing that there's brokenness in your life, I need you to know that your life is broken because your relationship with God is broken. That's the reality. Your life is broken because your relationship with God is broken. Jesus Christ came. He stepped out of heaven and into earth to come and heal that which is broken. You need to know that no one is born right with God. If you were to die tonight and you were to stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? My fear is that you would believe the answer, because I've been a good person, would be an acceptable answer to God. That's my fear, is that you would see that as a good response. Well, what you need to be clear on is how you define good and how God defines good are two totally different things. See, God is perfect. In his place, heaven is a perfect place. We are imperfect people. It makes no sense for an imperfect person to get to spend eternity in a perfect place with a perfect God. See, God's definition of good is perfection. So if you're an imperfect person, that means that you, in God's eyes, are not good. And that's why Romans chapter 3 says there is none who does good. You can never be good enough for God because you can never be perfect. You can never be good enough for God and that's okay. This is the beauty of Christianity. You can never be good enough for God. That's okay because Jesus Christ has already been good enough for you. He came to earth. He lived the life that you couldn't. He died the death you deserve to die. He was raised from the dead so that you too might be raised to a new life where your relationship with God is healed and you're able to spend the rest of this life and all of eternity in an enjoyable, authentic relationship with the God of the universe. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, my hope is that for the first time this morning you would experience Jesus as healer, letting him come in and heal your broken relationship with God. No matter who you are in this room this morning, William Wallace says, every man dies. Not every man really lives. You want to go through life and not just die, but truly live. You want to shoot up the scale of life. It begins with you answering the question that Jesus asks in John chapter 5. Do you want to be healed? Let's pray together. I'm going to ask... We're going to end things a little bit differently today. I'm going to ask our prayer partners to go ahead and come forward at this time. And with your eyes closed, I I just want you to hear my voice. What I want to do is I want to give you an opportunity to go ahead and respond to this question that Jesus asks. I think one of the worst things we can do is just move on and leave without first doing business in the quietness of our own hearts with this question. So in just a moment, I'm going to pray. And after I pray, you know what? You are more than welcome to come forward. And one of these prayer partners would love to pray for you. James 5.16 told us to pray for one another so that we may be healed. So if you'd like for someone to pray for you, you can go ahead and come down. That'll be fine. If not, you can sit in your seat and just do business with the Lord in the quietness of your own heart. But take time and answer this question today. 
Do you want to be healed? Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are and what you've done. Lord, we just acknowledge that you are indeed the healer of that which is broken. And so we just open up our lives, we open up our hearts, and we invite you in. And we just want to say yes in this moment to your question. Our answer to your question is yes. Do you want to be healed? Our answer this morning is yes. Maybe some of us have some fear about what that will look like. We fear that we will miss out on the life that sin has been giving us, but we just want to acknowledge that Jesus, your way is the best way. You are always the one who gives life. You never steal life from us. So we need you and we just invite you in this morning. In Jesus' name. This time is yours. You can come forward for someone to pray for you. You can do business with the Lord in the quietness of your own. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Timothy Atik, who just brought a message from John 5 on healing. Welcome. Thanks. So glad to have you back with us today. Love Faith Bridge. Always good to be back. That's awesome. Yeah, you've had a lot of change yep, happening in definitely. your life since the last time you were here. So congratulations. Thanks a lot. And welcome yeah. back. Um, so you, you talked today about healing. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to be healed yep. um, as the question was posed by Jesus? Um, let me ask you a couple questions around healing. Sure. Um, as believers, we know that ultimately Jesus heals. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean that we shouldn't pursue other means of healing? Yeah, absolutely not. I, I think that I, I think that to to kind of separate things would be a a big mistake because God is the one who gave you know gave man the wisdom to do certain things. So. Like, and Jesus be, is behind so much. So for example, if, if you need to go to AAA, you know what, that might be what God practically uses mm -hmm. to bring healing mm -hmm. in your life. If you read a good book, that might be what God uses to bring healing in your life. But I think that, I think the end goal or the most important thing is to see that it's ultimately, we're not trying to manage behavior here. We're trying to get Jesus to, to change something on the inside of us. And he's the only one who can, who can truly do that. And so, you know, God in his goodness has given us medical doctors who can help us with certain things. He's given us counselors. The Holy Spirit is called the counselor mm -hmm. because we are people who need counseling. And so go to counseling. Jesus works through that and uses that. God speaks through books. He speaks most clearly through his word, so read his word. But as I said in the message, he uses his people to help heal his people. And healing best happens in the context of community. I tell college guys, you need a, you need a few men who are kind of your army who will help fight with you. And so recovery programs like Celebrate Recovery or AA, these are good places where you can put yourself in an environment where you're, you're more likely to be open to Jesus's movement in your life, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, and so good. don't drive a division between those two things. Often, you know, Jesus has given us really practical things so that we're not here on Sunday morning just living in this big theory of like, okay, Jesus, heal me. Okay, he hasn't done anything. Well, I'll just hope for the best. No, he's given us these practical, tangible things. He's the one behind so many things that bring healing in our lives, in our world today. Um, so we see throughout the Bible, really, and I know we all know real life examples of where um, people are healed. Mm -hmm. And then there's examples where people 
aren't healed yeah. um, and they struggle maybe for a lifetime um, with yeah. uh, something. Um, how do we, how do we live well yep. in that place? Great, great question. Well, I think, you know, the right off the bat, I think, you know what, thankfully, we, we know that this place isn't our home. Mm -hmm. So any brokenness in our life is temporary because of Jesus. And so a, a day is coming where 1 Corinthians 15 informs us that this physical body will be resurrected and perfected, will spend all of eternity free from brokenness. No more hurt, no more pain, you know, no more struggle with sin, no more guilt, shame, and regret. So we have that kind of, we can see the finish line, and we always have to fix our eyes on the finish line. Um, yet at the at the same time, yes, there are times where people can put something completely uh, behind them, and so their struggle is com it's just in the rearview mirror. Mm. But then there's times where healing is sometimes Jesus's healing is that he just allows us to struggle better. You know, mm -hmm. that you lean more towards victory today than you did yesterday. That That is an indication of some healing. Yeah. It's not complete healing, but it is some, and there's life in that to mm -hmm. say that, you know, I have, I have done this a little bit less than I did before. That shows that there, Jesus has done something. And so don't, don't take for granted the four to a four and a half mm. transition because that's more, that's more life. And so that's what you want. The goal isn't to get to a 10. The goal is today I want to experience more than I did yesterday. And so to set that expectation that sometimes it is a lifelong process and that's okay. You don't have to feel like you are just a wreck because you're not completely over something. There's some things that, you know, we, we have to remember while Jesus wants to heal us, we also have an enemy who is out to steal, kill, and destroy constantly. So there is healing even in the midst of the battle. And the fact that you're fighting more mm -hmm. is actually a sign of Jesus's healing in your life, that he is healing. The fact that you're fighting more, that you're, that you're, you're engaged in the struggle even even more that you're struggling you sense that you're aware of your struggle more is a good sign of healing that your awareness of it i'm just rambling now but i'm trying to set expectations and get people to a point where they can appreciate the small fruit in their lives that's good so, that's good yeah. and ultimately the hope that we have yeah. um in the yeah. temporary yeah. of our condition. Well, thank you for that message. And yeah. thank you um, just for the way that I know many people who are suffering from a variety of brokenness mm, sure. um, were encouraged today um, through prayer and through healing. So thank you for being with us you today bet. and for that message. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll be back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.